welcome. Uh, very first installment of Desert Island Art. Really, really pleased to welcome back to uh, the interview, Bill Wadman, the photographer. Hello, Bill. Hello, how are you, Sandy? <laughs> Fine, thank you. Um, for those people who missed our earlier interview, I've got some examples of Bill's work up on the screen. Um, a wide variety of photographic styles represented, but of course I have my own agenda and I've picked photographs that I do especially love. But Bill, have you got anything to say about my selection? Uh, I, well, you yeah, picked a, a number of these uh, uh, motion ones, which I like, and the other ones are of dancers. You, apparently, like you, you like my dancers and my long exposures is what you like. <laughs> yes, I do. Every, every shot there is of a performer of some kind. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you're a performer as well through your photographs. Uh, to some extent, I think that's true. So um, we talked a little bit before about the format of Desert Island Art. For those of you in the UK, you may be familiar with Radio 4 Desert Island Discs. This is exactly the same thing. Um, I'm really looking forward to talking to Bill about his top five uh, pieces of art that have really influenced him. So we're going to start with a wonderful painting by Caravaggio. Bill, over to you. Oh, the calling of St. Matthew. You know, I had a print of this painting for the last 30 years, and I hadn't, I'd been to Rome, but I'd never gone to the church where this is at. And um, I, there's something about, the, it's all about the composition of this painting, right? It's, what's funny about it is that I, my original print of it actually cut off part of the window. So it was more of a landscape sort of four by five kind of uh, ratio shot. Mm -hmm. and when I realized that it was actually square, <laughs> made me really happy because you'll see this one and the next one that I'm a big fan of square uh, compositions. There's just something about the the you know symmetry of of, of the square. It just feels like you're you're seeing almost like a, a a real space just because you get as much height as you do uh, width. Um, but this one is all about the characters, right? This is like you know Jesus coming in and 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 finding Saint Matthew and and everyone always points to Jesus' hand there being very much like uh, Michelangelo's uh, Adam's hand, you know, reaching out to God in the Sistine ceiling. So there's all that. But really, for me, it's, it's all about this light. This, you know, light coming from one side, like knocking in, hitting everyone. The Chioscuro thing that, you know, that, that all these Italians did that, that Caravaggio was obviously the master of. Mm. Um, apparently, though, it, when, this, when this painting was originally done, um, that the they've looked at the um the windows and that there was actually a lot of light coming through the window and he actually blocked them up and made it darker in in the final version which i think is really interesting because you do look at it and you think why would that window be blocked up and why would it be so dark and wouldn't that be adding light to the situation but he he just minimized all that it's also interesting to me that even though the sun's coming in and it's hitting a little bit of of jesus there like Jesus is sort of in almost complete shadow there. He's not in that shaft of light. You know what I mean? He's getting just a little bit on the side of his face, but the, mostly the shaft of light is coming from the top. Um, there's just something about the, the sort of dance between all of the subjects. And there's I even like the guy who's got his back to you. It's just like, you don't see that in the painting all that often, you know, where there's somebody who's like literally turned and you're looking at his butt to some extent, you know? <laughs> Which, which I just, I, I think is kind of cool. And of course, the one guy in the middle there who's, who's, who's like pointing and going, really, that guy? That's the one you want? <laughs> I, just, I just like him in the middle there. I mean, um, when you look at your work, we can see very similar qualities of light. Would you agree? I mean, this kind of painting is... Well, th this is what I'm trying to do. Yeah, this is, this is, this is like the, um, you know, the, the ultimate master doing his thing. Um, uh, I just, I just, I also like the fact that everyone's that there's so much negative space up top. I mean, look, I mean, look how much, half the painting really doesn't have anybody in it. Like everyone's down the bottom half of the painting, mm -hmm. um, which just goes to show you, you know, you don't have to do tight crops of everything. You don't have to fill all the room. You can have a lot of room around somebody and the main subjects don't have to be in the center. They could be all over the place. When you're making your photographs, do you, yep. um, do you ever deliberately allow a lot of negative space anywhere? It's not something all I the time. It's not something oh, you, I notice, though. Oh, interesting. Uh, I tend to think about it all the time. I mean, a lot of it's, what's interesting is that a lot of times I'll send stuff to um, uh, uh, like uh, um, 
are buyers and, and picture editors and stuff. And they'll end up cropping a picture of mine and be just, and I'll think, oh, you messed up the whole composition there by cropping in on the person and, and, and moving them to the center or whatever. Um, I try to leave more space, especially with like environmental portraits. I like to have a lot of space around people. Mm -hmm. um, do I end up having them in the middle a lot? Yeah, sure. But I also like to not have it be all about them. I mean, even when I take portraits, I don't use long lenses, right? I don't use portrait lenses at all, ever. Um, I'm always, always using wide angle lenses to sort of get a larger scene and then place the person in that. Um, but yeah, maybe I need to do more of that. It's a, it's a, it's a, sometimes it's really hard because you can really screw up a, a composition like this by just having it be a hodgepodge of people. Now, a painter, of course, is different than a photographer because he can make changes after the fact more easily than we can, you know, assuming you're not doing some crazy compositor, that kind of thing. But there is, there is this whole, like holistic sort of uh, circle of guys on the left there. And, you know, Jesus is coming in with, I forget who the other character is with him, okay. but there's this, there's this whole idea that, you know, there's this group of people around a table and these two guys come in and interrupt the scene and there's like an activity to it. It's like, it really does tell the story in a way that a lot of photographs don't and a lot of paintings don't. Um, this one is actually, it feels like this is capturing a moment, I think, uh, this particular painting. The next one we'll get to in a minute, I feel like is capturing a moment, but is also very much sort of a state of mind, which, yeah, we can jump to the next one if you want, just for a second. So yeah, this is the Daughters of Edward Darley Boyd by John Singer Sargent, which is, honestly, if I had to choose, I think this is my favorite painting of all time. Mm -hmm. And it's, in fact, I have it here on my wall as well. Like, it's, it's like, I just, I have it everywhere. <clears throat> um, this is at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. It is a big painting. I don't know exactly how big, but, you know, six by six feet or something, a couple of meters square, yeah. um, which, I mean, I, wait, can we, can we go back to the Caravaggio for just one second? So there's two things about this. One is you'll see they're both square. Both, they both have kind of like this warm tone. They have all these great characters, but they're also both big. There's like a scale to both of them. I mean, this painting in, in the church in Rome, which is like a block and a half away from, uh, um, wait, it's the Pantheon, right? That's in Rome. I always get the two mixed up. Uh, it's like two and a half blocks away. And it's like one of those situations you go in and there's like a, a coin slot and you stick a Euro coin in and the lights go on, you know, yeah. that, you know, that whole, that whole racket. Yeah. And I just sat there with like a handful of Euro coins, just plopping them in and just staring at that painting. I was just like, yeah. this is amazing. I always yeah. find when I'm looking at uh, Caravaggio, he always seems so incredibly accomplished. He's one of my most favorite painters. Yeah, but he was uh, a real jerk. He was a jerk, I think. <laughs> but. Also, the thing that's interesting maybe about this is this is quite an early painting in his career. Mm -hmm. um, and it was one of two that were commissioned. In fact, it was commissioned in someone's will. Yep. Uh, someone else had already done the ceiling. Uh, yeah, it is one of the finest examples, perhaps, of illuminated faces. Uh, um, totally. And what's interesting, I think, about Caravaggio in general is that while there are so many that we talk, you know, the, the Bacchus painting of the kid and, and all the rest of them, there's certain Caravaggio paintings that you look at and you think, oh my God, it's, it's perfect. Like you go look at this painting and you zoom in on it, you're just like, it's just lovely from soup to nuts. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of Caravaggio paintings where the lighting doesn't work quite as well or there, you know, there's that one, there's that one at actually at the at the um, National Gallery in London where it's like the the perspective is a little off. There's like a guy in the foreground and his arms too big or something like that. I've also look it up exactly which one it is, but but like some of them don't work quite as well as others. And I think this is sort of one of his masterpieces. Um, and Caravaggio is like, you know, one of my superheroes. You know, there's if actually if you were three today. Yeah. If you were alive today, obviously his, his limitations were governed often by who was going to pay him. And the commissions at the time usually came from people within the church or within kind of royal. Merchants. Yeah, royal stuff. Yeah, super rich. If people, he was yeah. alive now, what kinds of um, scenes and scenarios do you think he'd be painting? Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> it's, you know, that's a good question. But at the same time, do you think that he would exist in this world this way? You know what I mean? Would yeah. he have been a painter? Of course. 
Yeah, but I don't know because I feel like the, I mean, okay, we're gonna we're gonna go deep for half a second here. Okay. I look at I look at this kind of art, and while there is plenty of more modern art, I mean, Sargent being sort of a, a, a I don't know, like a stepping stone towards modernity because there's sort of like there's a lot of sort of impressionistic things in that other painting we'll get to in a second. But I feel like in some ways like figurative art and light usage and stuff sort of maxed out around the time of Caravaggio to me. It's just like, this is nearly perfect, right? Like it doesn't get much better than this in the next couple hundred years as far as like beautiful paintings of people that like feel rich and alive and that kind of stuff. Um, so I wonder sometimes if, if the, 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 the art that the people made at that time would even be made nowadays, or if because the world around him was so different, he would have been an expressionist or a sculptor or a photographer or, you know, a, a, a TikTok. Uh, well, <laughs> you know. let, then let's imagine Caravaggio as a, as a photographer. Imagine he was yeah. based into New York now. Probably yep. would annoy you, wouldn't it? Yes. <laughs> but but you know but to be fair you know there are thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of people who are way better at what I do than I am so like I have no I, it's it's funny while I think I do good work I have no ego in saying that I am great at what I do you know because I see so many other people who are so much better than me so yeah, it would drive me nuts if Caravaggio was around making photographic works that looked like this. Although I'll have to send you afterwards. Um, I made a photographic version of this. In fact, I think it is in my, on my website in the, in the conceptual section. A bunch of people were over for dinner on a Christmas about eight years ago. And we recreated this for fun at our Christmas dinner. And it actually came out pretty good. I will, I will admit, I like that one. Well, you know, but, the, the Getty Foundation uh, competition in lockdown, lots of us at school actually participated in recreating paintings. I photographed my brother yeah. um, in the style of Van Gogh. I didn't um, see that one. Is, is it, did it come out good? Yeah, I'll show you it uh, okay. another time. And also we tried as a family to do um, Judith beheading Holofernes. But again, yeah. <laughs> all these kind of recreations are one thing, but actually to, to try and put these people into a contemporary paradigm, you're right, maybe it's the impossible question. But yeah. actually, photographically, I'm sure we're agreeing that we could see that this as a photograph would be equally as compelling. Yeah, well, what the, the other interesting thing about this is that, you know, this is supposed to be Jesus coming in and doing this stuff. No one was dressed like this in the year, you know, the year 26 or something, you know. Um, BC well, or C. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. But, but you know what I mean? Like, you know, the feathers and the caps and the silken stuff and everything. It's like, it's this weird amalgamation of, oh, it's the end of the 16th century. And it's also, you know, the time of Christ, um, which kind of makes it kind of cool in a weird sort of, we're all in playing dress up kind of way. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know, man. Caravaggio, it's the more it's what's frustrating about Caravaggio. It's definitely one of those don't meet your heroes things because the more you read about him as a person, mm. he was a real scoundrel, may have killed people. Like, I mean, he was a real bad time, but he made such gorgeous work that you just kind of you can get lost in it, you know. Yep. So, we're um, going to move on to Argent yep. painting. So, this painting is at the MFA in Boston. I went to college in Boston. And I had a uh, uh, art professor, uh, a art history professor who, you know, he would take us to the MFA and he loved this painting and would like spout about it for 20 minutes at a time, uh, much like I'm going to try not to do. Um, he had this theory that, that it was all about sort of this uh, uh, Fibonacci sort of spiral going on in this painting, that the, that the red screen on the right, which ends up kind of being an arrow pointing down, um, you know, goes down to the rug where the little girl is, which the rug points to the girl on the left, which kind of, so it kind of spirals in from the outside all the way into the little girl in the middle, who's almost like right in the middle. And, you know, these are four daughters of this, you know, rich aristocratic sort of, or, you know, American aristocratic uh, uh, family. And they used to travel all the time. Here's a little cute little story is that these two giant vases that she's leaning against there and the one on the right, um, 
when none of these four women ever married or had children. So they all sort of, I think there was like serious mental health stuff going on in their family. And um, none of them ever had families. And so when they died, the remaining people of the Sergeant or of the uh, Boyt family donated those two giant vases to the MFA. So they're next to the painting. When you go see the painting are these vases. And apparently inside there was all kinds of stuff from like a hundred years of stuff getting thrown in the top of them. There's like a tennis ball from the, you know, 1920s and that kind of stuff, all this crazy stuff. But, you know, there's a number of things in common with this one, right? There's like, there's just the one light source, this, in this case, coming from the left. Mm-hmm. But you also have the character of all these different girls. I mean, the little, the little kid on the ground, I just love the fact that all these little girls' faces are really detailed. But then you look at the doll or you look at her dress on the left, and it's really just these like knife cuts of white paint, you know what I mean, that, that, that he's carving out. So it's like there's detail where there needs to be detail and there isn't where there doesn't need to be. And it sort of creates this weird, like it's, 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 it's real people inside of impressionistic world. Hmm. Um, Do you find some- painting unsettling anyway, like in a kind of psychological way? There's lots of things that um, have been written about the painting like, well after the fact, though, a kind of sure. Freudian interpretation. Um, oh, I hadn't read any of those. Go ahead. Give me some. No, just more that uh, there is something in the depth, the quality of the depth into like back to black, going into that dark space sure. of young girls on the cusp of becoming young women. Uh, the uncertainty yeah. of their lives. Um, you've mentioned already that none of them married, which at that time in context of their family connections was probably quite unusual. Yeah, um, something, something must have been really wrong for that to happen, yeah, you know. Yeah, across four yeah. daughters. Um, but I'm wondering about the, the unsettling nature of their expressions. Uh, I, I always found, I found the like physical, the visual depth of the painting going into darkness. And it's funny because like there's a lot of different the photographs of this painting don't quite do it justice that that there's like there's both detail and blackness in in the shadows back there it's almost like it's it's got a little bit of like a ring fill light or something filling in back there you know what i mean so it never really goes to like black black Mm -hmm. um that that never bothered me um but i mean the the looks on the faces i mean the fact that there is you know the oldest one who doesn't even want to look at the see i'm gonna betray my thing but the the oldest one who doesn't even want to look at the camera as it were you know who's just sitting there just like I don't even want to be here mm-hmm. you know there's the one slightly older next to her who's just like okay I'm kind of probably 12 or 13 I'm a woman but then you go over to the nine-year-old or whatever over on the left and she's like right in the light she doesn't mind being you know in the lead so I think it shows the the, the discrepancies between all the girls and probably the relationships between them to some extent mm-hmm. but no it never bothered me although you know uh, there's also the mirror in the back and everyone computer like puts this and uh, Las Meninas, uh, mm. the Prado in the same thing. In fact, a couple of years ago, my wife and I were in Spain and we go in and we're I'm like staring at Las Meninas. I'm like, I really like this Velasquez <laughs> painting. I was like staring at it. I was just like, God, this is so much better than I thought it would be. And this, that, and the other thing. And I'm staring at it. I'm like, why do I like this so much? And Heather goes, cause it looks like the Sergeant. And I was like, Oh, and so I start doing a little research as we leave. And apparently at one point they actually flew this painting over to the Prado and had them up next to each other for a while because, you know, this is an inspiration. I didn't even realize that at the time. I think um, this, was, this was on, when this was uh, seen first of all, I think it was seen first of all in Paris where the girls are painted because this is their Parisian apartment. The boy. Yeah. Um, a critic at the time wrote very publicly about Sergeant's debt to Velasquez. To Velasquez, yeah. And, but I mean, there's so many little things about it that are just, I mean, the fact that, you know, the little girl in the front is staring right into the camera, you know, there's the mirror in the back, there's like all of these elements of it. The fact that it's square and big, I mean, these are all very similar kinds of things. So, so yeah, it, it's, it's, do you think that there's a, there's something psychological about, I don't know, my, fetish for lack of a word uh, uh, about large square paintings. Do you think there's like something to that? Like why that makes me feel comfortable in a way? Instagram it's funny because I, right? I, it's like, I kind of think I'm going to start shooting square exclusively for a while. <laughs> I think that's going to be my new thing. I'll get my Hasselblad out. Um, there's just, I don't know. There's something geometrically right about it, you know, which of course it is, it's square, but 
you know, when I went from, when I went from a three by two camera, like a, like a regular 35 millimeter SLR kind of thing. And then I went to my camera, which is more of a, it's like, a, I think it's a four by three ratio sensor. It's like the, the more close, the closer to square that I get, the more comfortable I feel. And I think these two paintings are, are good examples of that. If you ask other people who are photographers, do you think that they would tend to choose five photographs over at least two paintings? No. They choose paintings. Sometimes, yeah. Um, yeah. You, I mean, I've said at the beginning, you're my first uh, interview like this recorded, but I'm speaking uh, later to Keith Dotson, who I've interviewed in the past. Yep. And like you, he's chosen, he's actually chosen Japanese with block prints. Oh, interesting. Um, as well as photographs. Yeah. Um, I have a, a friend who's a professor of education and philosophy at Glasgow University. I'm interviewing on Tuesday. He's chosen lots of kind of, um, well, he's chosen painting, but also um, ancient sculpture. Sure. Uh, people have come up with all kinds of things. I think to ask anybody five things that have really inspired them from the vast history of art. I mean, you wrote to me and you said, this is hard. It is hard. You know, if someone asked me, I, I wouldn't be able to do it, maybe. I, I wouldn't yeah, do yeah. it again. Um, because I think once one starts to piece apart what really has profoundly affected one and what's influenced anybody over the course of their own artistic career, we also probably find that we've been influenced by different things at different points. I think, it, I mean, it all does also come down to when you, I mean, so much of this stuff is the time at which you kind of discover it, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, both of these paintings, the Caravaggio I probably kind of discovered in high school. My sister was living in Italy at the time. Um, uh, I, think, I think the Sergeant, like I said, I discovered in college. So it's like they were very um, specific ways about themselves oh yeah here we, we're gonna we're gonna go to irving penn but wait let me just say one more thing about you don't have to jump back to it but um it's i am very visually eurocentric it's like i i can go i can see japanese woodblock prints and i can appreciate them for what they are but in the same way that i'll look at i'll listen to music indian music or something like that and it'll do all kinds of things with scales that we don't generally do in the West with microtones and quarter tones and all this kind of stuff. And I'll listen to it. And it's like, it's almost like I can appreciate it. I can understand kind of what they're doing, but it doesn't speak to me. But I think sometimes that comes down to, you know, the, 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 the language that you learn when you're youngest is sort of like what you're kind of stuck on. And I think in some ways, my visual language, even in my photography, tends to be very traditional. I am not an avant-garde photographer in some way, you know. Um, I think all of the stuff that I do is trying to echo back to Caravaggio and Sargent and Penn and Saul and, you know what I mean, these different people. Um, sometimes I think that that's sort of one of my, you know, marketing failures as an artist is that I am not trying to break out of some construction in some ways I want to refine the things that have been made the the, the corners that we found already I want to go in there and 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 refine them you know um but yeah so here's Irving Penn and I mean this is basically every Vanity Fair cover that <laughs> Annie Leibovitz has ever done right I mean yeah. this is, <laughs> I mean that's this is what she's ripping off and this is 70 years ago um so, I mean, Irving Penn was doing stuff back then that, it's funny, there's, I mean, you can go back and you can look at fashion stuff from Cecil Beaton and all these people in the 20s and 30s and whatever. The minute you get to the 40s, you start seeing Irving Penn and suddenly it feels like this isn't far from modern. You know what I mean? Like you could look at this and stick all the biggest models in the world today in the exact same things, in the exact same dresses with the exact same lighting and it would still look great. In fact... Yeah. As I said, that's what they've been doing for Vanity Fair for the last 25 years. Yeah. Um, so I feel like this is an example of like sort of a proto version of modern group photography. Um, and by the way, it was very difficult picking, picking one Irving Penn shot. Um, I see Irving a, Penn in, in so many of your photographs. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I wish I was one fifth of one tenth of one percent of, of what this guy was creating. I mean, he was supposedly a real SOB too, um, Irving Penn as, as, as a person. So in fact, I, he was still alive when I was in New York and I kind of kicked myself for not having looked him up, but I wasn't in big into photography at the time. So, um, it's funny. There's a, there's a, there's a, um, there's a portrait of Auden, the poet, uh, that, that, that Penn took that I, it was between that one and this one that I wanted to choose. And I ended up choosing this one because I think, having the group and having all these, first of all, it's interesting that these 12 women are all white women, right? Like if you did this now, it would be a much more uh, uh, diverse group of people in the shot. Uh, just goes to show you how much we've changed in 70 years. Um, yeah. but, but, but I kept, I went back and forth between the group portrait and Irving Penn's individual portraits. I mean, my corner obviously is not exactly like his because he was like had a nice acute corner and that was kind of the game. Mine literally is a corner of my apartment. Um, but but when I but when I look at his stuff, it's like there's a certain simplicity to it. I mean, this is I don't know if it was a skylight or whether it was strobe or or you know heart, like hot lights coming bouncing off the ceiling or coming down. It doesn't really matter. It looks like natural light. Um, but I mean, look, he's just, he's like, I'm just going to roll up carpets on the ground and the background isn't going to be perfect. Look at the upper, upper right-hand corner. I'm just going to put up these gobos behind them and, and all this kind of stuff. And it's really about posing all of these people very similarly, by the way, to the Caravaggio, right? Where it was all about these people around the table and they're all fitting in like Tetris pieces mm -hmm. so that no one's doing the same thing as anybody else. No one's trying to get in anybody else's space. They all have like their own space to sit in and the whole thing kind of gels because they're all coming together like a jigsaw puzzle do you think that's and, because he was such a masterful still life photographer that's a good question um i mean i think his still life stuff is good i think his portraits are better um so i think one of the things about Penn, i was i've always heard this story that you know where some photographers like me are very social people and want to sit and talk to the person and get inside their head and, and that kind of stuff. And, and I know a lot of people like me, Penn was very much, you are here to get photographed by me, the great photographer. So you will take this seriously because I take it seriously. There was sort of like this unspoken sense of that. So we're going to go into the church, which is the studio and do this, hmm. you know, sacred thing, which is me standing behind the camera capturing you. I mean, there was like, there was definitely like this kind of formality to it. Um, I was reading something about him not long ago uh, about his uh, compositional economy. You know, he, as you've already said, he didn't like glamorous backgrounds. In fact, he yeah. hated them. He thought that the subjects ought to speak for themselves of glamour and yep. elegance. And, I mean, granted, it, yeah. that's true. But I mean, look at, look at the women in this photograph. Every single one of them is gorgeous wearing these crazy dresses, you know, with the hair and stuff. So yes, while the backgrounds are plain, each one has spent three hours in chairs doing makeup and getting their hair done and stuff, you know. Um, I'm just going to read you a quote from Penn, actually, because I think it's relevant to what you're saying. Sure. Um, this does, I think, say something about him. Uh, he said of what he loved about shooting portraits, fashion portraits, is that they couldn't run away for that moment of time. They belonged to me. Yeah. There's like a possession mm. element of that. I mean, I think, especially at the time, there's probably a real like misogynistic angle to that too. You know what I mean? Like these beautiful women are coming in and I have the power over them, you know. Do, they, um, do these girls belong to Sargent, singer Sargent? I think to the extent that they're rich, probably very strict parents said, you are going to stand here and get your, I mean, they were all painted individually, of course, but you know, um, you were going to stand here and, and this very nice man is going to, or maybe not even nice man is going to come in here and, 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 and you're going to listen to what he says. I think there's an element of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Sargent is an interesting thing because I mean, he was painting all of these portraits at a time when you know he he became the person to have come make your portrait so every rich person on earth especially all these rich women or the husbands of the rich women would have sergeant come in and do, and take a painting uh, do a painting of them similar actually to the stuff that Penn would normally later do you yeah. know it's, i mean it's just it's a generational shift i'm going to just 
go back to the vases for a second, these empty sure. vessels. Sometimes when we look at the overview of Western art, anything that features women, you know, they are shifted around like objects. Yeah. Like objects. Yeah. I do wonder in terms of the meaning of this painting. And then also more actually in Penn's photograph that, that women are empty vessels. I mean, I think in 1947, I mean, this is, these are models who were not supermodels in the way that we know them now, right? I mean, who have, I don't think anybody knew these people's private lives, you know, and Penn actually ended up marrying uh, the one on the middle left, right? I think the one in, in profile mm. um, uh, after this shoot. Um, so I think that in some extent, I mean, look, you look at fashion, you look at the people on these things. I mean, they are, they are human clothing hangers, basically. You know what I mean? Like their job is just to make the things that they're wearing look good so that people buy them. It's weird. Fashion photography is a strange thing because while I think that there is a ton of real beauty in fashion photography, there's real, art, real artistry in fashion photography. And you look at Penn, you look at Avedon, you look at all those guys back then, all the way through La Chapelle now and, and guys now who... I'm not a huge fan of, but put that aside. Um, I think that there, there is this myth that there's like this deep art in it. But the reality is, is that it exists only for commerce. You know what I mean? No one's taking these kinds of pictures. This, these pictures wouldn't exist if it weren't for the fact that they were trying to sell a $3,000 dress, you know? And so uh, sometimes I feel like there's, there's not, while they may feel real i don't think that there's a whole there's very little authenticity in them um and I, I mean i've shot a handful of i'm not a big fashion person i've shot a handful of people that you literally could not take a bad picture of because they're just gorgeous men and women um i personally don't find it incredibly interesting because it's it's almost like too easy you know it's like mm -hmm. it's like I, I like i don't need to do anything and this is great so how would I make this even better than that? Well, I guess I guess that's my problem. I'd almost rather take something that's like really hard to shoot and make something good than make something that's great, astounding, you know. Um, but I mean, Penn was ultimately a fashion photographer and he was shooting for, for all the magazines. You know, it was all, in the end, Condé Nast stuff, you know. Mm. Um, Vogue for so, 60 years, I think. Much the same yeah. as the Beaton in the UK. I mean, exactly. this might be a, a total contrast now, but here is, in my opinion, also the king. So yeah. So I had lunch, I, I had lunch with Saul later once. Oh, did you? Yeah. He gave, he, there, was a, there used to be an organization, actually, there still might be in, in New York, called the PAI. It was the Photographic Arts and Imaging. It was this group of, of amateur photographers who would get together once a month and have a, um, a luncheon. And they would have come speak, people come speak at the luncheon. And this guy, Randy Duchesne, called me up one day and said, hey, would you like to come speak at PAI? And I was like, yeah, sure. So I went and spoke and, and that allowed me to come back each month for the next year and like just, you know, come for the thing. And they would meet at the National Arts Club, which is this beautiful old Victorian house on Gramercy uh, Park. And with Tiffany windows, and it was just like this ridiculous thing. But they would have this luncheon in the back, and Saul Leiter came and showed a bunch of his work. And this was, this was, two thousand nine, maybe. And I, I didn't, I honestly didn't know who he was at the time, just because it was, it was before I realized who he was. And uh, and he got up there, and he's showing some of his work. And you know, Saul had this. Did you see the documentary about him, the In No Great Hurry documentary? Ah. Oh. You have to watch it. It's all just interviews with him as like an old man in his studio showing pictures and talking about his life and stuff. It's really good. It's all, it's called In No Great Hurry. And he's standing up there and he's like, you know, kind of this small old New York Jewish guy. And he's just like, he's like, I don't know why everybody cares about the pictures that I took 50 years ago, you know, but because for most of his career, I mean, he would do work for Look Magazine and Life and all these different people. But like, he was not greatly known as this street photographer when he was taking these pictures. These pictures were taken and largely forgotten until they were sort of brought back after many years that people started noticing them. And early color like became this huge rave, but like, it's not like at the time Saul Leiter was, was the guy in every single, you know, 
book showing off 1950s and 60s America, especially New York. So that's, I think he's deprecating quality. That was something that you're now showing. I mean, you, you've spent uh, the interview today I, again, very much downplaying the beauty of your photographs. Uh, thank you. But I mean, yes, I mean, I'll take that as a compliment. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that there, it's not, it's not, it's not downplaying it. I think, I think in some ways Saul was a little different because I think Saul wanted to be recognized, but wasn't recognized for a long time. And I think that when his recognition came late in his life, um, that, that he really didn't, quite know how to handle it you know what i mean he was selling lots of prints at Green, greenberg gallery but he still lived in this for probably a lot of money but was still living in this tiny little apartment you know in 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 the lower east side um because i think it just it just it it was it was weird to him that it all turned around like really late in his life which is i mean look how many artists there are who are completely forgotten for most of their lives and are only really discovered after they die and it same time the flip side is how many artists were a huge deal in their lifetimes that we've completely forgotten about now writers and and, and painters and, and whatnot um i think something something about especially a lot of the stuff in early color is that saul's paintings were all it's like there's this voyeuristic quality of this sort of simpler time on kodachrome in new york you know when when colors were saturated and yet things were still kind of gray. I mean, there's really only one color in this photograph, which is the yellow of the truck going by, right? Everything else could almost be black and white, um, which, is, which is what I like about it. I think that it's, it's nice. It's a little bit like um, all the photographs on the moon and everyone's just like, it's gray, it's black and white. It's like, no, it's not black and white. It's just that everything there is gray. Um, it's actually a color photograph. You can see there's like a red, white, and blue flag on, on the ship or whatever. And I think that I had a hard time choosing which of the, the early color photographs uh, I wanted to put in here, but there was something about the simplicity of this one that I always liked, you know? Mm -hmm. In fact, that you don't really know what this guy is looking at, what he's doing, but it doesn't really matter. There's just like this sense of what it looks like in New York City in 1960, just from this. Um, and anybody who hasn't seen all of early color, you really should, because it's foundationally beautiful. Mm -hmm. When you use a, a sort of element of reductiveness in your color palette, mm -hmm. are you thinking of something like this as reference? No, I mean, I, usually when I'm you, I mean, you like to point out the the my color choices in in my photographs. I remember that from last time, but I never, I don't really think about color consciously as much as I probably should. I'm more thinking about the shape of the person, mostly because they're, they're portraits or their expression that they're giving me at any particular time. I know I'm annoying, but can we just look at the color for a second? This is the person <laughs> saying he's not consciously thinking about color. I'm not. Hey, look, one of those is black and white. What kind of crazy person are you? <laughs> I, th then I'm doing it unconsciously, honestly. Like I'm, I'm re I really, I mean, I always like the red, uh, motion picture, the one of Iran uh, in the red, but that was a happy accident because she happened to bring a red thing. All the rest of them I shot with sort of a nude tone, like the one on the left. Um, so yeah, I guess you know what a lot of people see, but in some ways, if you go back to Saul's picture, I mean, I'll, none of my pictures have this sense of very, just a single color, you know what I'm saying, in, in this way. A lot of, there are a lot of people, I mean, I think even Dan Winters does that, where he'll desaturate a lot of different colors in his picture so that one of them kind of pops up to the fore. Mm. Because with color and with sharpness and with all these different things, it's all about the contrast between the thing that has color and the thing that does not. So in order for, you know, the yellow to pop, it's not about saturating the yellow, it's about desaturating everything else so that the only thing left is the yellow. Now, of course, in this picture, this is just by chance that Saul happened to be standing there looking out a very gray window with a, with, a, with a yellow truck blazing by. It's also interesting, this one, for me, because I am not generally a fan of street photography. Uh, I mean, I think it's really beautiful sometimes, and I think some of them are exquisite, but to me, it's, it's more like, I know, I have another one. Uh, 
But see, it, it, but in some ways, I don't think this one, while it is street photography, you could also have created this one. Actually, he did. Uh, I know. Yeah. Well, there's, there's rumors that he did. Is there actual proof that he did? The, the man holding the painting is a friend of his. So he went to Mudong, oh, there you go. which is, for anyone ever looking at Mudong, where it is and what it is, it's always described as a quiet French uh, Parisian suburb. And so I, went, I went when I was in Paris a few years ago. I went to this street, took this picture over again. I'd love I to did. see that. Yeah. Um, yeah, he took his friend back with him because he hoped to somehow look at the composition to, to create well, echoes in the composition with the, with the train, the shapes. Well, honestly, I mean, you need, you, it's, it's funny because there are, there was a, there was a docu a BBC documentary about photography that they use yeah. this picture as like the example in the first, I think the first episode of the first scene. Yeah, one of the most brilliant documentaries ever about photography. Genius of photography. Genius of photography. Yeah, which is, is really good. And, but the, the, the thing about this photograph is that it's all about, it's not, I mean, the location is great, but mostly it's about the elements that are transient, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. the, tr take out the train and it's nothing take out the guy in the front and it's nothing. It really requires all of these people being there. I still like the woman with the, like the, uh, the shawl over her shoulder to the left of the guy with the painting. You know, and, and what actually is he holding? Is it a wrapped painting? Is it a, you know what I mean? Is it a mirror? Is it you know, a big piece of wood? Like we have no idea, right? I mean, that's the, the mystery of that is, is half, the, half the battle. Um, As this is a Desert Island art interview, you know, you're on your desert island, you've got these five images with you. What particular kind of joy does it bring you to look at this? It's, I think that each one of these, part of the reason why I chose these is because each one satisfies a different urge for me, you know? I'm not particularly religious, but I like looking at religious art because it's so simplified in many ways, so, that's why you have the Caravaggio. Um, I think that like the modern equivalent of that is sort of the Sargent thing that, 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 that is sort of a, a simplified version of these four girls in the parlor of their rich fancy house in, in 1908 or whatever the heck it was. Um, uh, Penn is, 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 reminds me of like sort of, I'm not a huge fan of pop culture, but like sort of 1950s onward you know, sort of where we are now. It's sort of an idealized version of the sort of glamour that I think was the best of Western glamour before it kind of just kind of went off a cliff. Um, sure, there were problems with it. I'm not saying that it was perfection to have, you know, 12 white women as the picture of glamour. But um, And then, then you get to these two photographs, which are, I mean, Saul's photograph is, while it's from 1960, is also very modern feeling and reminds me of New York. This photograph reminds me of the time, you know, between the wars, before the Great Depression, you know, when, when, when there was some, it was modern and there was optimism, you know, in the 1920s at the time. Um, and you had somewhere other than I don't, I mean, I, none of the others are sort of of Paris streets, right? I mean, this is, you know, a Paris suburb, but like a street in another country. What's weird about this place actually is that, you know, all these buildings are still there. So like the picture I took is this building that's still there, you know, a hundred years later. Did you get her um, to stand there with a painting under her arm? I had her standing there acting like she was holding a painting on her arm. Yeah. Actually, wait, 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 real funny story is that I got, we, we were on our way back from Versailles and I said, long story short, I got on my, the, the machine ate my ticket and the guy at the ticketing place told me just to get on the train because it was about to leave. And when I got on the train, the ticketing people who were looking, checking tickets were coming through. And even though I paid and slid the thing through, it didn't pop up so I could grab it. So I had a receipt. And so I was hiding from the train ticket people so they wouldn't give me a 50 euro ticket or whatever it is even though I had paid, it's a longer story because it screwed us two days before. But the first place we could get off was Merdon, which is where I wanted to get off anyway. And we got off and I said, I think I found the place where this 
photograph was taken because I saw the rail line and the whole thing and I went on Google Maps and I kind of put a, a, a mark on it. So we're walking around the little town squares and I, and I went down one street like two blocks over that it turns out was the wrong place. And I was like, no, that doesn't look right. And I turn around and there's this old guy walking down the street and I don't speak French. I was like, excuse me, uh, you know, do you speak English? And he's just like, he's like, no, he probably did, but he was, you know, being an old Frenchman. And I showed him this picture. I like held it up on my phone and he goes, <laughs> like, like that, like turn around, take a left, go to the right. And we did, and that's where it was, you know? I mean, I can't imagine that many people in 2017 or whatever, 2015 are going here to go find the, to recreate a Kirtesh photo from 1928. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, so, I like found this place in the suburbs, but there's like, so, so when I go here, I also think about the fact that I've been there. And when I see the Sargent painting, I think about the fact that I've sat and stared at that painting for a bunch of times and looked at those vases. And you know what I mean? There's like a, there's like a, a memory. It's like a memory game a little bit. Um, kind of reminds me of the things that I love about my life. Um, New York, traveling in Europe, you know, being in Boston, looking at that painting. I mean, these are like the things that I think about when I'm trying to think about reasons to be happy. So. Well, what better reason to have these particular images with you on your desert island, Bill Wadman. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Very, very interesting session with the first ever installment of Desert Island Art. Thank you.